You've probably heard the story of the courier. That nobody shot in the head outside of Good Springs by a band of hired guns looking for a quick payday. The legend, who not only managed to rise from the grave, but travel across the breadth of this unforgiving wasteland. Or, to some, the monster of the Mojave. His story is either one of heroism or terror. All depends on who you ask. Some say the courier was a pillar of justice, helping folk all across the Mojave, while others swear that the courier was the worst thing to happen to the wasteland since the Great War itself. No matter what you may have heard, nobody would dare deny the courier's actions have had permanent consequences for the Mojave as a whole. Though to understand how we got here, we need to go back to the beginning. People have different opinions on when exactly the end of the Mojave began, though most claim it was right after the Second Battle of Hoover Dam. The new California Republic, backed by the Courier, fought a second bloody battle against the invading Caesar's Legion, with the Courier's involvement in the skirmish ultimately tipping the scales in the NCR's favor, as independent factions from all across the Mojave came to his aid in expelling the Legion from that old world wall. After the Courier bested Caesar's legate, the battle for the dam was officially won, ensuring the NCR's foothold in the region. Or so it seemed. When the fighting ended, the Courier, ever the wild card, commanded the NCR to immediately withdraw from the dam and all surrounding territories, in the hopes of ensuring New Vegas' independence for years to come. The history isn't conclusive on who exactly the courier was working for, whether it was Mr. House or some other mysterious benefactor. One thing, however, was for certain. The NCR had different plans. Labeling the courier as a terrorist, the NCR forcibly annexed the Strip later that year, worsening the already high tensions in Freeside and other surrounding areas. Local gangs like the Kings and the civilian population of Freeside already hated the NCR, which made this sudden occupation one of the many straws that broke the Brahmins' back. The NCR would then begin a number of questionable pursuits, including sending full battalions to Lake Mead in an endless manhunt for the Courier, performing brutally inhumane experiments on any local Freeside residents unlucky enough to be out after curfew and perhaps their most foolish pursuit of all, their expedition to the Sierra Madre Casino. Tucked away in an obscure corner of the desert, the Sierra Madre is said to have been one of the last great bastions of pre-war excellence, a veritable paradise offering untold riches and the promise to begin again. Today, the only thing that godforsaken casino promises is certain death. Using tribals from the now disbanded Legion as a labor force, the NCR sought to collect any pre-war artifacts they can get their hands on. And as a result, that's when they discovered the Cloud. This toxic nightmare was unlike anything the Republic had ever seen before, corroding and poisoning everything it came into contact with, from living flesh to the strongest suits of power armor. Even brief exposure to it could bring the hardiest of prospectors to the brink of death, a property the NCR took a keen interest in. Like any nation hell-bent on expansion and protecting their territory, the NCR's mind was on the cloud's potential as a weapon, and should have come as no surprise to anyone when they began bringing samples back to the Mojave later that year for testing. However, while the NCR remained mostly undisturbed in their dealings in the Strip, a new threat presented itself from the west. A massive, radioactive dust storm, straight out of the depths of the Divide, was headed for the Mojave, threatening to destroy entire cities and cut off countless supply routes. Divide dust storms were infamous for their destructive nature, scorching the earth and flaying the skin of anyone unlucky enough to be caught in one. The NCR, as always, was resolute in their careless attitude for the rest of the Mojave. Deciding to keep this information a secret, they began drawing up evacuation procedures, 
exclusively for military personnel. Meanwhile, tensions in Freeside began to reach a fever pitch. Incidents of Freeside residents being abducted by NCR forces for experimentation were on the rise. On top of that, the boots on the ground were becoming more shameless in their public executions, gunning down unarmed civilians in broad daylight. The kings and other local combatants would occasionally get into scuffles with the NCR, but things came to a head when it was uncovered that a dust storm was headed right their way, and the NCR fully intended on leaving them behind. From that point on, it was all-out war. Vengeful Freesiders attacked any NCR soldiers they could get their hands on, while the NCR began brazenly killing any local they thought posed a threat, innocent or otherwise. Things would quickly go from bad to worse, when soon after, the Strip was engulfed by a new strain of that toxic cloud. Hard to say what exactly caused this, whether it was a result of the Freeside Rebels or some kind of external sabotage, but the damage was done. The NCR completely locked down the Strip shortly after, leaving anyone unlucky enough to still be inside New Vegas, including their own troops, at the mercy of the cloud. The Freesiders, now calling themselves the New Vegas Rebels, took advantage of the reduced NCR presence and continued their bloody rebellion. Breaching the gates to the Strip, the Rebels aided in the escape of many of those trapped there by the NCR, fighting back the leftover military presence for as long as they could. The rebels were ultimately repelled by the NCR though, as they took to the sewers and other surrounding areas to escape them. The NCR ordered a full evacuation of their forces from the city shortly after, knowing the impending dust storm brought the Strip's tactical potential to zero. Their precious New Vegas was a lost cause. After Vegas had fallen to the cloud and the rebellion, it wasn't long until the rest of the Mojave suffered a similar fate. That radioactive dust storm eventually arrived, and the Mojave paid the full price. The storm helped spread the cloud across the entire southwest, as flying winds and deadly radiation mixed with the cloud's toxins, making it all the more lethal. Whole settlements and towns were either evacuated or completely annihilated. Old NCR garrisons had their communications severed, leaving them easy pickings for raider tribes and ravenous cannibals. Smaller settlements like Good Springs were hit with old world plagues that slowly snuffed out the life of their little communities, leaving them nothing but disease-ridden ghost towns. The Mojave had become a living hell, a waking nightmare for all those unfortunate enough to still be drawing breath. Old settlements fell under the tyranny of new rulers as tribals and cannibals used the desolate ruins as camps. Townships that had once traded bighorner steak and banana yucca fruit now played host to those with a much less refined palate. The storm suffocated the sky, casting the entire landscape into an eternal, hazy darkness. The sun had set for the last time, but in the dark, a new nightmare began to rise. One more disaster from the Divide was slowly invading the Mojave. The Tunnelers. Subterranean Terrors. We don't know a lot about where the Tunnelers came from, just that they came from the Divide before migrating to the Mojave. In the past, we'd only come across these Tunnelers in underground or shaded areas. Must be in their nature to fear the sun, since they spend so much time avoiding it. In the Mojave, however, they don't have that problem anymore. Thanks to that thick curtain of radioactive dust blotting out the sky, the tunnelers have free reign of the place, come rain or shine. We call this little section of history, The Fall. A somber name, but a fitting one. Sometimes I wonder what exactly The Fall is referring to. Maybe it was the fall of Vegas, lost in a near impenetrable cloud that killed both rebel and soldier alike. Maybe it refers to the fall of the Mojave as a whole, a land now infested with underground horrors and suffocated by radioactive toxins. Or maybe it's a nod to the fall of the courier himself, the one man so many people blame for all these horrors. Say what you will about him, but you can't dispute that he acted in Vegas' best interests. Or at least, 
what he thought were its best interest. Hard to imagine someone doing anything in the name of that hellhole. But I've heard stories that back in the day, Vegas was once a sort of oasis in the wastes. Something worth fighting for and over. Makes you wonder what actually happened there. What happened to the New Vegas Rebels? And who actually released the toxic cloud? Questions like that don't have easy answers. Vegas was in no way the first place to be hit by the cloud, nor would it be the last. In fact, if you were to travel to any NCR-ran city in the last few years, they wouldn't look all that different from the day's Vegas. In a wasteland choked by radiation and toxic air, it's easy to believe that the old world was some kind of great bastion of hope and civility. I suppose any part of history can seem like a halcyon dream when compared to life today, but it's important to remember that the old world wasn't exactly a polite society, regardless of how well armed they were. After all, polite societies don't usually end in atomic fire. For anyone still feeling nostalgic for the back when times, you can find plenty of examples of the kind of society the old world was still haunting the wasteland today. The Sierra Madre Casino is a good start. Whether it's the husks of people skulking around in welded-on hazmat suits, or the unkillable ghosts firing red-hot beams of death from their eyes, that casino harbors plenty of examples of the evil the old world could produce. Take that toxic red blanket surrounding the casino as Exhibit A. Some people make the mistake of thinking that the cloud occurred naturally, a byproduct of some faulty air conditioning system in the villa, but they'd be dead wrong. No, a crime against nature this heinous could only be the work of man. In a few years before the Great War, the founder of the Sierra Madre, Frederick Sinclair, was eager to fill his casino with state-of-the-art technology straight from the big mountain. Sinclair's hope was to be able to both protect his casino from foreign invasion and provide for any survivors left after the bombs dropped. He must have had some foresight for what was to come, as he nearly bankrupted himself in the process. In the end, he did manage to acquire the technology he desired, while inadvertently agreeing to have his villa become the new test site for a number of Big Mountain's supposedly harmless prototypes. It's not a stretch to believe that the cloud was one of them, coming straight from the Big Mountain's innovative toxins plant. The rest is history. The cloud was unleashed on the villa after the ventilation stopped working, flooding the streets with a haze of red death. Worse yet, Hazmat suits made specifically to withstand the cloud came with their own unique drawback. Sure, they let you breathe safely within the cloud, but their metal hinges were easily corroded by it, sealing anyone wearing one inside forever. Another harmless innovation, courtesy of Big Mountain. For years, the Sierra Madre lay dormant, the toxic cloud surrounding it acting as a sort of twisted preservation system. In a way, Sinclair got his wish. His casino was forever protected. Some intrepid folks still made their way to the casino years after, leaving messages like gone to the Sierra Madre on walls in the Mojave, though their stories all end the same way. That was until Elijah. Father Elijah, a former elder of the Mojave's Brotherhood of Steel, arrived at the Sierra Madre like many others, seeking his fortune. Though Elijah's definition of old world treasures may differ from yours and mine, after suffering a crushing defeat at Helios 1 by the NCR, Elijah went looking for a way to put his brotherhood back at the top of the food chain, as well as wreak havoc upon the Republic that had humiliated him. Elijah saw the cloud in the casino's hologram system as the perfect means for his revenge. Problem was, he couldn't gain access to the casino without the help of others. What resulted was a number of failed heists into the Sierra Madre, each ending in betrayal and death. Only when the courier arrived would Elijah finally get his ticket in. We don't know exactly what transpired afterward, whether the courier killed his associates and left Elijah for dead, or ended up helping the old man in his vendetta against the NCR. What we do know is that only the courier walked out of that old world casino. And from that point on, the legend of the Sierra Madre only grew. The courier's visit confirming its existence to all kinds of interested parties, including the NCR. They would make their first expedition to the Sierra Madre a few years after the Second Battle of Hoover Dam in search of pre-war artifacts. 
keeping up their long-standing tradition of using former enemies as a labor force, the NCR had a group of tribals from the now disbanded Legion search the Sierra Madre on small clusters, before eventually giving them full reign of the villa. These raids, however, did not go unnoticed. Taking advantage of the limited NCR supervision, Elijah made contact with the tribals, leaving notes and other small trinkets for them. And in time, the tribals would come to venerate Elijah in the same way they once did Caesar, carrying out his will without question. Elijah used this to his advantage, manipulating these tribals into carrying out his long-awaited revenge. The tribals delivered their supervisors a sabotaged sample of the cloud, specially made by Elijah himself. They gladly accepted the gift and began shipping it towards their larger population centers. Places like the Boneyard, New Vegas, and other NCR territories all played host to a secret biological time bomb, just waiting to go off. The NCR, never knowing when to leave well enough alone, had their own plans for the toxin. Setting up shop on the Lucky 38 Casino Lobby, they began performing tests, using the cloud on any overly rowdy free ciders they can get their hands on, sentencing countless to a horrific death in the name of their cruel scientific pursuits. But they got results. The NCR had managed to create a strain of the cloud at least five times more potent and lethal than its Sierra Madre counterpart. It could kill or corrode anything it came into contact with in a matter of seconds. The NCR had effectively made the most dangerous bioweapon in recent history, fusing old world hate with new world fear. They didn't get to revel in that fact for long, though. As soon after the new strain was created, the Freeside Rebellion was becoming a clear problem for the NCR. But even this was nothing compared to what Elijah had been plotting. After extended fighting with the New Vegas Rebels, the NCR's toxic nightmare was unleashed upon the Strip. We don't know exactly how it happened, though most people assume that the New Vegas Rebels managed to inadvertently release the new cloud during one of their assaults at the Lucky 38. Though there's no doubt in my mind that this was all Elijah's doing. The Strip was soon suffocated by that toxic cloud, killing anyone and everyone unlucky enough to be outdoors when it was unleashed. It spilled over to areas in Freeside as well, only stoking the fire of their bloody revolution. By the end of the day, Sin City had become hell on earth, completely inhospitable for anything that still walked on two legs. But it wasn't just Vegas. Large NCR cities like the Boneyard and many other NCR territories were met with the same fate, all victims of Elijah's hatred. There's no telling just how many died in the days that followed. The cloud's destructive effects were felt even as far as Zion Valley and further into Arizona. At long last, Elijah had done it. An entire nation crippled. Not a single bomb dropped. What followed was uncertainty. If it weren't for the survival of a few larger settlements like the Hub and Shady Sands, the NCR may not have survived Elijah's grand scheme. Over time, the NCR developed a way to disperse the cloud from a given area, something that ultimately helped them take back the Boneyard and most surrounding NCR territories. They've done a good enough job cleaning up Elijah's mess, though the damage the cloud has done will never truly go away. Take Vegas, for example. It's been years since the cloud was unleashed on the Strip, and there's still no sign that the NCR plans on doing anything about it. I can't say I blame them, though. Even if they were to disperse the cloud from Vegas, assuming they could even work with this harsher strain, they'd still have to worry about the dust storm covering the rest of the Mojave. Worse still, something tells me that the Strip's new denizens wouldn't take kindly to any more NCR guests. They didn't used to be like that, though. Before the cloud and annexation, the Strip was a kind of paradise in the wastes, a place to booze, gamble, and whore to your heart's content. Folk living in and around Vegas enjoyed general autonomy, so long as you didn't piss off any Securitrons. Things slowly changed when the NCR began to assert their dominance more and more, much to the local gang's annoyance. Freesiders were never really the kindest of folk, but no one deserved what the NCR did to them. When you think about everything that transpired leading up to their rebellion and the endless horrors that Freesiders were put through under NCR rule, well, for the people of New Vegas, enough was enough. They say that war never changes. Sure, the tools used to wage it 
and the hands that wield them may change over time, but that all too human capacity for complete destruction, the capacity to make unending war, that never does. It's hard to say why we wage war, whether for personal or political reasons. Maybe it's just our way of letting loose and giving in to our more base instincts. Maybe that's why they did it 200 years ago. War was a handy outlet for a number of their human vices. And for the rest, well, they had Vegas. In the old world, back when it was called Las Vegas, folk from all across America would travel to this bustling city to gamble, drink, and scratch any other primal urges they may have had. Locals could sit by a pool of rad-free water and sip the best liquor the old world could offer, all while watching distant mushroom clouds from the comfort of the strip. They'd never dreamed that the city of endless excess and debauchery would soon die with them. When the bombs dropped and the world officially ended, Vegas was one of the few locations in the country that wasn't directly hit, thanks to the handiwork of one Mr. Robert House. Surviving didn't necessarily mean thriving, though. As for the many years that followed, New Vegas became just another mess of old world stone in the desert. That would only change when, many years after the Great War, Mr. House, still alive somehow, spotted an NCR scouting party nearby. You probably know the rest. How Mr. House tamed the tribals and put them in charge of his casinos, rolling out dozens of Securitrons to keep the peace. As Vegas established itself as its own independent state in the Mojave, locals from all around the wasteland came to blow their money on booze, women, and slot machines. Just like the good old days. Problem was, even if Vegas didn't fundamentally change, the world around it certainly did. Folk who didn't exactly hit the jackpot in Vegas didn't have cushy jobs to go back to like in the old world. Instead, once their caps went dry, that was it. Their entire life's fortune gone in an instant. Most of those unfortunate souls took to the area surrounding Vegas and set up shop, probably in the hopes that they may still one day strike it big and earn their fortune. Partner that up with a number of armed thugs and chemedics, and you've got Freeside. Worse yet, the benevolent Mr. House had his eyes focused on the Strip, only using Freeside as a means of filtering out anyone he saw as an undesirable. Freeside was without rule. Murders, robberies, and extortion became the law of the land for a few years, at least until order was finally established by a few factions. A gang of fashionable punks known as the Kings began operating out of an old world religious building dedicated to an old god, same as a branch of the followers of the Apocalypse. The Kings helped to keep the whole of Freeside from erupting into all-out chaos, while the followers helped the community's basic needs of water, food, and medical supplies. Independent stores opened up in Freeside as well. Places like the Atomic Wrangler, Mick and Ralph's, and the Silver Rush helped give Freeside a certain something that Vegas lacked, a twisted sense of community. Sure, life was hell, but life was hell for everyone. Well, at least for the locals. As more people came to the strip and droves, Freeside soon played host to all sorts of new denizens. These squatters didn't get much sympathy from the locals, especially if they were NCR. In the months leading up to the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, there were a number of incidents involving the NCR squatters and angry Freesiders getting into violent spats or shootouts. The Kings in particular didn't care for the military presence, declaring in no uncertain terms that the NCR and their citizens were no friends of Freeside. From there, things reached a sort of status quo. The NCR didn't have the expendable resources to divulge on Freeside, too focused on the dam and trying to stay on Mr. House's good side. Times were tense, but manageable. It wasn't until after the Second Battle of Hoover Dam that Freeside was given much, much more attention. Once it was clear that the Courier's promise of an independent New Vegas was shattered, Freeside witnessed one of the largest military takeovers in recent history. The NCR marched into Vegas and its surrounding territories, taking the Strip for themselves and establishing their rule over Freeside. At the end of the day, an NCR flag flew proudly over the Strip, proclaiming to all that saw it that their way of life had changed forever. Predictably, Freesiders weren't too happy about their new NCR overlords, and tensions between the two groups only worsened by the annexation. As time progressed, Freeside and its surrounding areas slowly became a more and more dangerous place, not just through NCR persecution, but through foreign attacks as well. Now that Vegas was NCR property, the Republic's many enemies turned their gaze towards the city. 
Raider factions like the Fiends and leftover tribals from the Legion routinely staged attacks on Vegas, with Freesign taking the brunt force of their violent hatred. The NCR did little to help Freesign during these attacks, seemingly content to let the slums fight their battles for them. That doesn't mean they turned a blind eye to the community, though. Turns out, the NCR had bigger plans for Vegas than just liquor and slot machines. They set up an improvised research facility in Vault 21, and then later the Lucky 38, with the assumed goal of scientific progress. The NCR eggheads began experimenting with different forms of radiation treatment, hoping to find a more effective way to care for their irradiated soldiers. A noble goal, with a not-so-noble execution. The thing with any research project is that, eventually, you're going to need someone to be the test subject, and there weren't many NCR citizens lining up to be guinea pigs. Luckily for them, there was no shortage of Freeside junkies for them to forcibly volunteer. NCR soldiers began abducting Freeside locals in the night, forcing these mostly innocent folk to be cattle for their scientists' twisted experiments. As the situation escalated in Freeside, the NCR set in place a strict curfew, one that they enforced with great prejudice. As abductions and executions began to grow, the tensions in Freeside reached a fever pitch. There was only so much the locals could endure before complete anarchy broke out. And the NCR didn't have to wait long. When it was revealed that a radioactive dust storm was heading their way, and that the Republic was planning on leaving the rest of the Mojave for dead, it pushed Freeside over the edge. They began to kill any NCR troopers they can get their hands on, by any means necessary. The streets of Freeside became improvised war zones, with Freesiders employing guerrilla-style tactics in their fight against the NCR. Protests and vandalism became commonplace against NCR property and personnel. At one point, the Freesiders even stormed the gate to Vegas itself, launching a full-on assault on the Lucky 38 and killing plenty of NCR with them. Although the NCR was able to fight back against the Freesiders each time, the casualties they were causing did not go unnoticed. Unfortunately, the Freeside Uprising wasn't the only time bomb the NCR had to worry about. Shortly after one of the many revolts, a biological weapon was unleashed on the Strip, causing untold amounts of death and chaos. The NCR was quick in their response as they began to lock down the Strip itself, damning anyone inside to a horrifying fate. Only then would the Freeside Revolts become a genuine, full-blown rebellion. Renaming themselves the New Vegas Rebels, the King and his gang, along with a few other key players in the Freeside community, staged a full-on assault against the NCR forces, blasting open the door to the Strip and aiding the escape of dozens of those trapped there by the toxic cloud. The casualties were great, but in the end, the Rebels were still no match for the NCR firepower, ultimately being forced to retreat. Some of the Rebels were able to escape Freeside, while others took to the sewers beneath Vegas to continue fighting. The NCR had attempted to breach the sewers a few times, trying to exterminate the last of the rebels held up there, but found little success. After a series of failures and most NCR citizens being evacuated, the leftover military presence on the Strip decided enough was enough. They dumped radioactive materials into the sewers in order to sabotage the remaining rebel positions, before abandoning the Strip entirely. And just like that, it was over. A revolution with no victor. The few that managed to escape Vegas with the King went southeast towards Boulder City to hold up. They had survived the battle, but only barely, needing a place to care for their wounded and regroup. The King died shortly after they got there, suffering a fatal gunshot wound during the fighting. Left leaderless, the future of the rebels was uncertain. Rumor has it they managed to scavenge a few pre-war hazmat suits for an old NCR stockpile, which scarcely protected them as the dust storm finally reached the Mojave and mixed with a toxic cloud. Their fates are unknown, though I wouldn't recommend making your way to Boulder City to check on them. Meanwhile, the few rebels still held up in the sewers eventually were forced to leave by lack of supplies and the NCR's radioactive sabotage. Their hope was to be able to make the sewers beneath Vegas into a safe zone for any weary travelers in the wastes, though that never actually ended up happening. The remaining rebels made their way to Jacobstown, that old super mutant refuge northwest of Vegas. Hard to say what happened to them, but something tells me they could only coexist for so long. And just like that, 
the New Vegas Rebels were no more. Their dream of rebuilding Vegas dying with them. Vegas had died its second death, this time not by atomic fire, but by that all-too-human capacity for complete destruction. To wage war. No need for bombs when hate will do. The Rebels' dream of rebuilding Vegas never saw fruition, but it's still one that some people hold on to today. After all, they already did it once. Though the Rebels weren't the only folks who dreamed of returning to Vegas one day. A row against the R expedition arrived about two years ago with hopes of returning to the Strip. Not to rebuild it, but to continue doing their horrifying research. There's a saying that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. That even the noblest of aspirations can still lead to untold suffering. History shows countless examples of men with virtuous ambitions taken to their worst extremes. Nothing's more dangerous than someone who thinks their goals are righteous. The history of mankind is filled with people like this, folk a little too smart for their own good, with no compunction for human suffering. History's greatest monsters weren't just men of war. Some were men of knowledge. Monsters who traded their rifles for microscopes. It might be a comforting thought to believe that these kinds of deranged scientists are just a relic of the old world, one that died along with it. But for anyone who's been paying attention these past few years, you'll know that's far from the case. So long as there are men out there like Elijah or those Enclave kooks, none of us are ever truly safe from one day becoming guinea pigs. Even some of the so-called good factions out there aren't without the capacity for twisted and brutal science. When the NCR annexed Vegas after the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, there was a general uncertainty about what they had planned for the Strip. While most of the casinos were largely untouched, Vault 21 was quickly repurposed as an impromptu research facility, headed by the Republic's best and brightest. The eggheads there focused on developing improved treatments against radiation sickness, as more and more NCR personnel were dying thanks to irradiated water and dirty bombs. At the head of the project was a man by the name of Edwin Royst and his assistant, Lydia Bernard. Both were geniuses in their own right, scientists willing to go to any extreme to see their goals realized. They pursued their research with near-reckless abandon, almost as if they had a personal attachment to finding better ways to rid a body of rads. In the beginning, their research was fairly benign, with their main focus being improving on all sorts of pre-war inventions, all to little effect. Their work was slow, and in many cases, not all that successful. After it became clear that Royce and his team had little to show for their work, the NCR bigwigs pulled their funding, seemingly killing the radiation treatment project for good. But Royce was far from finished. He and Bernard were dead set on finding ways to effectively cure radiation poisoning. They couldn't just sit by and let all their efforts go to waste. In a desperate attempt to see their endeavors through, Royce agreed to develop experimental weapons for the NCR in exchange for continued funding of his personal research. As a result, Royce and Bernard once again set their sights on radiation treatment, occasionally diverting their efforts to create new and deadly toys for the Republic. It became clear to Royce that if his team wanted to see concrete results, they would need to immediately move on to human trials. Freeside dissidents and rule breakers became common test subjects for Royce and Bernard's experiments, each being subject to an increasingly inhumane fate. These experiments included being exposed to lethal amounts of radiation and even being injected with FEV. Also, Royce and his team could learn just a little bit more about the effects of radiation. It's hard to say just how many were sentenced to death by Royce's cruel experiments, but it was enough for the rest of Freeside to start to take notice. After a while, the project eventually bore fruit, as they developed stronger versions of both Radex and Radaway, capable of fully curing radiation sickness. However, this came at a terrible cost. While the chems were undoubtedly more effective, they proved to be invariably fatal to human life killing all who took them shortly after the initial use. Royce and his team weren't deterred, however, and pressed forward with their research. Unfortunately for them, that research did not go unnoticed. The head janitor for Vault 21 Labs stumbled across Royce's research notes, 
and soon discovered the numerous bodies of past test subjects that had been disposed of underground. Horrified, he threatened to expose their crimes to the world unless they put an end to their twisted experiments. You can probably guess how well that went down. The janitor was forced into a very early retirement and soon became just another body on the slab. He would still have the last laugh, though. Thanks to some clever sabotage on his part, a number of insane test subjects were released, killing numerous researchers and resulting in the NCR's complete abandonment of Vault 21. As would become typical, they piled tons of radioactive waste into the main entrance of the vault, ensuring that no one would ever uncover their dirty work again. Roy's team were moved to the Lucky 38 to continue their research shortly after, both on radiation treatment and on developing weapons for the NCR, one such weapon being the Cloud. We don't know for certain who created the more lethal strain of the Cloud, though the evidence points heavily towards Royce himself. During his time at the Lucky 38, even more horrific experiments were conducted on unsuspecting Freesigners. Some of them were subjected to the same lethal doses of radiation as those in Vault 21, while others were suffocated by new and improved strains of the Cloud. What you and I might call evil, they called progress. By the time the Cloud was unleashed on the Strip, and with the New Vegas Rebels attacking at full force, Royst and his remaining scientists were among the first NCR personnel to be evacuated from Vegas. Forced to abandon their research a second time, his team narrowly managed to escape the clutches of both Rebels and the encroaching dust storm. Like many of the evacuating NCR, Royst and Bernard made their way back to California, leaving the Mojave behind for good. Or so it seemed. For the first few years following the NCR evacuation, no one seemed all that eager to find out exactly what transpired in the Mojave. For years, Edwin Royst and Lydia Bernard were free to explore whatever scientific queries they had, putting the atrocities they committed back in Vegas behind them. However, as time went on, sentiments began to change in the Republic. In just a matter of years, the NCR came under new management, as the followers of the Apocalypse once more began to hold sway within the highest Republic ranks. Ten years after the fact, and as a result of these reformist attitudes, the NCR decided to launch an investigation into what exactly happened in the Mojave Wasteland. It didn't take them long to discover all the twisted things Royst had done, and he was arrested shortly after. Royst was put on trial for his many crimes against humanity, and currently faces conviction for a whole laundry list of human rights violations. It may seem like a fitting end, justice finally served against a remorseless monster of a man, but Royst and Bernard's story doesn't end there. The problem with men like Royst, or with any brilliant mind with no conscience, is that they're bound to amass a following. A number of troops who used to work with Royst were outraged at the idea of him being put on trial, seemingly deciding to overlook the many horrors that he had inflicted on others. They argued that a mind as brilliant as Royst's could not afford to be locked away or executed, and that his research provided immense value in the future of fighting radiation. Their anger fell on deaf ears, however, as it was clear to those in charge of the Republic that they cared little for the troops' misplaced loyalty. One of the loudest voices calling for Royce's freedom was none other than his old research assistant, Lydia Bernard. Unable to stand by and watch as her old mentor was tried for as many crimes, Lydia set out with a number of NCR deserters back towards the Mojave, in the hopes of finding something that could clear his name. They made their way back to the Mojave only a decade after they left, being able to see firsthand the terrors that their research brought about. Setting up shop at the summit of Black Mountain, Lydia Bernard and her loyal troops endlessly plot to find some way back to the Strip in Lucky 38, hoping to find the precious research they need to clear Royce's name. That's why you'll still come across squads of NCR troopers in the Mojave today, but make no mistake, they stopped serving the bear a long time ago. Instead, deciding to follow Royst and Bernard down their road to hell. It's hard to imagine they'd find anything that could vindicate Edwin Royst. Seems like Lydia believes concrete proof of their research's benefits will absolve their many sins. Rumor has it that they found out their experimental chems were effective in clearing out the rads from some lake out near Camp Golf, but they've still got a long way to go before they can show anything that could justify Royst's crimes. To this day, Lydia and her goons still plagued the Mojave, hoping to one day return to the place 
they should have left dead and gone years ago. Some people struggle to let go of the past. Maybe if Lydia took a long, hard look at what she's done, she'd realize that Royst is getting exactly what he deserves. But something tells me she doesn't have the capacity for that kind of self-reflection. An old friend once told me that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Lydia and her NCR deserters are a great example of that. Folk too loyal to one man to see all the evil he's done. They're not the first to fit that bill, though. Years ago, a whole different kind of faction followed that mantra, revering a cruel despot the same way Lydia and her troops do today. But if their ending is anything like what's in store for Bernard and her followers, then she'd be wise to take a good long look at the past. In today's ever-changing world, there aren't too many things you can count on with any certainty. Folk back in the day made a big stink about trying to predict the future, though a look at the world around you will make one thing obvious. There weren't too many clairvoyant types back then. But you don't have to see the future to know that some things are bound to repeat themselves, sometimes more than once. One such certainty is that every great nation, empire, or legion will one day inevitably fall. Whether it was the American Empire before the Great War or the New California Republic in Vegas, eventually, all great societies face extinction. But that kind of genocide takes more than just bombs and bullets. Now, if you truly want to see the death of an entire society, you'll need to kill its identity first. Years ago, there lived a man named Edward Sallow, a member of the Followers of the Apocalypse who, like many in his ranks, dreamt of bringing about a better world. Edward's ideas weren't nearly as altruistic as others, though, as following a missionary trip to Arizona, he found himself in the custody of a group of tribals known as the Blackfoot. Edward trained this small tribe in the ways of total warfare, teaching them numerous military tactics and the basics of weapon maintenance. In time, Edward and the Blackfoots went on to defeat the six other tribes in the Arizona wastelands, resulting in the Blackfoot declaring Edward to be their new de facto leader. Reveling in this new power, Edward took on the name Caesar, or Caesar, and set in motion his own plan of bringing about that better world. Caesar quickly reorganized the tribals he had conquered into a genuine fighting force, the Genuine Legion. Using his limitless control and expendable forces, Caesar began a campaign of assimilating dozens of other tribes under his banner. Members of these opposing tribes were either conscripted into the Legion's ranks, used as slave labor, or exterminated altogether. Tribe after tribe was absorbed by this ever-growing cancer, until Caesar's Legion became the strongest military force east of the Colorado. Built on brutal slavery and armed with the best soldiers of 87 tribes, the Legion's hold on Arizona was unquestionable. 87 tribes, each with their own culture, beliefs, and heritage, eradicated by Caesar. Not just physically, but in the spiritual sense too. Though the survivors still lived in endless servitude to the Legion, the identities that they were born with, that molded them, were all put to the blade. Names like the Blackfoots, Twisted Hairs, Hydebarks, Painted Rock, or the Sundogs became distant memories in the minds of those forced under Caesar's control. They only had one identity now. The Legion. In the years that followed, Caesar would eventually come across the one tribe he could not destroy or assimilate the New California Republic. Once the Legion began its expansion into Nevada, they saw the NCR's might firsthand, seeing their military capabilities and expansive territory. Most importantly, they saw Hoover Dam. The dam's great strategic potential was not lost on Caesar, and so began his plans of taking the entire region for himself. Inevitably, the Legion and the NCR met at Hoover Dam fighting a bloody battle that only narrowly resulted in the NCR's victory. Undeterred, Caesar established Fortification Hill, a command post east of the dam, and began to slowly amass more power and influence. What followed was a long period of proxy battles and sabotage. Caesar saw it fit that when his forces attacked the dam again, the NCR would be in such a disorganized state that any chance of victory would become impossible. And this all probably would have come to pass if it weren't for one highly motivated courier. 
When the Second Battle of Hoover Dam finally began, the Legion once more stormed that Old World Wall, determined to make the NCR the next tribe to fall under their banner. But what should have been a tactical victory quickly became a series of catastrophic failures. The NCR was able to beat back the Legion thanks to not only the Courier's intervention, but also through the many allies he made during his travels. The Legion suffered a number of surprise attacks, ranging from an attack by the Great Khans to a bombing run from a group called the Boomers. Even Fortification Hill itself wasn't safe, having been razed to the ground by an entire army of Securitrons, also courtesy of the Courier. After the death of Legat Lanius, the Legion's only remaining field commander, the battle was officially over. What was supposed to be the Legion's most decisive victory yet turned out to be the start of its undoing. Those who managed to survive the Battle of the Dam chose to retreat and regroup with other Legion survivors. The years that followed were a tapestry of defeat and suffering. Seeking revenge for the Legion's radiation bomb at Camp Searchlight, the NCR in turn used their own modified strain to the cloud to utterly annihilate the remaining Legion bases in the Mojave and Colorado. This scorched earth tactic helped drive the last few nails into the Legion's coffin. Those that weren't exterminated by the NCR were instead used as free labor. The remnants of the dead bear tribe saw this firsthand when they were brought to the Sierra Madre. The tribals were adept at navigating the villa's toxic cloud, scrounging for pre-war artifacts to take back to their NCR wardens. However, once a new figure stepped in to take Caesar's place, the Dead Bears tribe had a new tyrannical ruler to follow. Renaming themselves the Cloudwalkers, the tribals staged a bloody revolt against the NCR station there, forcing those they didn't kill to abandon the casino altogether, destroying the only gate out behind them. After the bloodshed ended, the Cloudwalkers proudly flew the flag of the Legion once more, as their new Caesar gave a rousing sermon of how they should all rejoice in their grand victory. Their new identities began and ended at that old world casino. One legionary splinter still resided in the Mojave well after the Second Battle of Hoover Dam, taking the town of Novak during the Legion's assault. Already stretched thin, the NCR either didn't have the men or just didn't care enough to retake the settlement, leaving it in Legion's hands for years. Unfortunately for them, with the arrival of the tunnelers and the Divide's dust storms, the Legion contingent there faced a problem that brute force could not solve. Hunger. With their leaders dead and their supply chains devastated by tunnelers, the Legionnaires at Novak faced potential extinction, until their leading centurion offered a solution. Calling upon the heritage of his old tribe, the centurion taught his men the tradition of devouring the bodies of those slain in combat. The belief was that by consuming the flesh of an enemy, you would in turn gain their strength and power, becoming even greater warriors. The Centurion believed that by using this tactic, he and his legionnaires would walk out of the Mojave, stronger than all others, and go on to rebuild the Legion once more. It only took a few years for him and his men to become nothing more than a band of crazed cannibals. Instead of following the flag of the bull, the remaining survivors in Novak came to instead worship the all-knowing god, Motel, having by this point forgotten their past lives altogether. Most of the tribals you'll see roaming the wasteland these days once belong to the Legion, though few actually remember it. They operate out of former Legion-controlled areas, old bases that still proudly fly the bull's flag for an army that no longer recognizes it. After the loss of their leaders, many of the now former legionnaires quickly reverted to their tribal ways, returning to whatever heritage and culture they possessed before their assimilation. Old legion headquarters that had once stood for the faction's strength and resilience are now meager cannibal camps or desecrated holy places, their inhabitants caring little for the history, even if they were once a part of it. After many years of conquest, assimilation, and expansion, the death of the legion had finally come. There was no exact moment in which the Legion died. Their demise was a gradual, slow death of attrition. Every Legionary killed took a bit of the Legion with them. Their society was one dependent on constant expansion, a feature that only worked for so long. The Legion was, in a sense, an idea, one that, over time, was slowly forgotten by those who once so proudly believed in it. There's a certain cruel irony in the Legion's fate. 
a faction so committed to annihilating the identities of those it absorbed, but unable to prevent itself from suffering that same fate. Like all great nations and societies, destruction was inevitable, a cruel fact of life in the day's world. Maybe one day, something else will take the Legion's place, and maybe it might even learn from the failures of its past, though I wouldn't bet on it. The fate of the Legion is a sobering reminder of just how far a great power can fall in just a short amount of time, how even those who think they have control over their own futures are still powerless to the hands of fate. But there's someone out there who's experienced that kind of fall firsthand, a man who walked the breadth of the Mojave, enduring the endless hardships it offered, a drifter who fought for the independence of New Vegas, a courier that rolled the dice and lost it all. Picture this. You are a courier for the Mojave Express. Your work takes you all across the wasteland. It's hard, but honest work. One day, you take up a job to deliver a package to the New Vegas Strip. What should have been an easy delivery ends up being a chance meeting with fate. You're left in a shallow grave, buried and bleeding, only to be saved by the goodwill of strangers. This is your turning point, the moment in which your life changes forever. When you arise from what should have been your deathbed, you make your way across the breadth of the Mojave, killing scores of raiders and hired guns, blazing a trail of swift justice in your path. What began as a simple journey of revenge thrusts you headfirst into deciding the fate of the Mojave for years to come. You travel to the most remote of old world casinos, pulling off heists 200 years in the making. You walk the near endless trails of Zion Canyon and traverse the deepest pits and chasms of the Big Empty. You even brave the harsh terrain of the Divide raining down atomic fire on both Legion and NCR alike. You've seen the worst the Mojave can offer, and walked away from it, stronger. All that's left is the second battle of Hoover Dam. Live a life half that interesting, it'd be hard not to think that you're unstoppable too. The courier must have felt that exact way when he finally journeyed to the Hoover Dam. Backed by an army of Securitrons and the support of Vegas behind him, the courier helped the NCR annihilate the Legion from that old world wall, calling in a few favors along the way. Inevitably, the courier came face to face with the only remaining leader the Legion had, the legate Lanius. Heralded as the son of the god of war, considered to be the fiercest warrior the Legion possessed, Lanius left a trail of carnage in his wake. In short, a perfect match for the courier. So much so that most folk don't even agree on how the courier actually bested him, or how the final blow was even dealt. Some say that he single-handedly killed Lanius through brutal combat, while others claim that the courier defeated him using his words alone. Regardless of how he did it, one thing was certain. The courier had won the day. All that was left was to secure Vegas' future. After the fighting ended and the NCR marched into the Legate's camp, they met face to face with the courier. What was meant to be a simple congratulations quickly turned sour as it was made clear that they were no longer welcome there. The courier reasoned that neither the Legion nor the NCR should have access to the dam and that, alternatively, it belonged to Vegas. Under threat of death by Securitron, General Lee Oliver, the highest ranking official at the dam, had no other choice but to turn tail and leave. Promising the courier that this wasn't the end, he and his men walked all the way back to California, spreading news of their humiliation. Once again, like so many times before, fortune had smiled upon the courier. For a time, there was an uneasy peace. The courier had brought about his dream of making Vegas an independent state in the wastes, free from persecution or oppression by a corrupt government. Having destroyed the Long 15 and expelled their forces from Hoover Dam, the courier was sure that he had seen the last of the NCR in the region. From here on out, Vegas would truly live up to its name as the Oasis in the Wastes. At least, that was his dream. 
The courier's entire life up to this point had been one constant gamble, and unfortunately for him, his luck had finally run out. Making good on General Lee's promise, the NCR returned to launch an all-out assault on the courier, not long after their initial loss. Retaking the dam and moving into the slums of Vegas, the NCR waged a hard-fought battle against the Securitrons in the surrounding areas, seemingly bringing the whole might of California behind them. They made short work of the courier's forces, taking Vegas for themselves and forcing the courier to abandon the city. From that point on, he was a terrorist and was to be hunted with extreme prejudice. What was meant to be the beginning of Vegas' golden age came to a grinding halt. His dream became a waking nightmare, as for the first time since Good Springs, the courier had truly lost. What followed were years of hiding and evasion. The courier was a wanted man, and the NCR seemed to spare no expense in trying to take him down. Numerous hit squads were sent out into the wastes in search of the courier, each more dangerous and eager to kill him than the last. Not that any of them ever returned. The courier's exile gave him plenty of time to think, to consider what he had done and how things had fallen apart. As time went on, the courier developed a maddening hatred for the NCR, seeing them as the sole root of all his problems. It was them who had taken Vegas away from him, them who had made all his travels and choices mean nothing. This hatred began to manifest itself more and more as the courier fought off the NCR assassins. What was once self-preservation became indiscriminate carnage. Not only would the courier kill his pursuers, he would desecrate their corpses to leave his warnings for any other NCR troops looking to claim the price on his head. In time, the courier was motivated by only one emotion. Hatred. Take a trip to Mead Canyon, and you can see the full extent of that hatred. The place is a veritable no-man's land, complete with booby traps, landmines, and the last few messages the courier ever delivered. It's likely this is where he spent the many years after his exile from Vegas, though he would not stay there forever. Eager to reconnect with his allies in and around Freeside, the courier returned to Vegas once more determined to take back what was rightfully his. Unfortunately for him, his oasis was long gone. The city had been smothered by the NCR's toxic cloud, its residents either dead or dying along with it. The Kings, Van Graffs, the Garretts, all gone. Worse yet, the NCR saw fit to blame the Courier for every catastrophe that befell Vegas and the Mojave from the cloud to the dust storm, all of them his doing. Though they could not kill the man, the NCR managed to kill his legend. If losing Vegas to the NCR had wounded the courier, seeing it in this state broke him. His mind plunged deeper into madness as the hatred that had fueled him for so long finally gave way to insanity. His body, though still formidable, suffered a similar fate. The years of radiation exposure seemed to finally take their toll, as the courier's body began to reflect the monster he had become. A ghoul in the shoes of a once great man. He made his way back to Mead Canyon, with the few remaining Securitrons at his disposal, and set up the wide array of death traps and bloody warnings you see today, still convinced that the NCR were out to get him. Thing is, the NCR gave up on killing the courier long ago, abandoning the manhunt the same time they abandoned Vegas. For years now, the courier has haunted the corridors of the Dead Lake, spending the rest of his life in his makeshift tomb, waiting for the next sorry bastard to try and kill him. They tried to pin this on me, you know. All of this. After Hoover damned the NCR at a price on my head. They said I was a terrorist, a war criminal. But all I did, I did for Vegas. I fucking did for Vegas. I fucking did. <laughs> the price for a head. And now you've come to pay it.
Most folk who talk about the courier today tend to forget about the things he had done before Hoover Dam, instead just rattling off the same propaganda the NCR fed them years ago. In truth, his story isn't nearly as black and white as that. He wasn't just a terrorist or a freedom fighter. He was a courier, one who walked the many roads of the Mojave and paid the ultimate price. The roads he walked helped shape him into the man he is today, that is, if you could still call him a man. Through great triumph and resounding defeat, the courier's road made one thing clear. Anyone's luck can change in an instant, whether you're in Vegas or not. No matter how altruistic or evil one man is, no one is ever truly unstoppable. And as for the courier, well, his road ended a long time ago. It's just a matter of time until he finally realizes it. Maybe if the courier had never been run out of Vegas, things would have been different. Maybe his pipe dream of making Vegas an independent power in the Mojave could have actually come true. Maybe. In the end, we'll never truly know. Perhaps someday in the future, some other motivated individual will come around and rebuild Vegas into something the courier will be proud of. After all, it's not the first time someone would have made something great from the courier's mistakes. Take the Divide, for example. What was once a nuclear hellscape has become a bustling little community in years past, accepting strays from the Mojave with open arms. In the back when times, there was a commonly held belief that anyone, no matter how down on their luck, could someday make a better life for themselves. That even those who hit rock bottom could just pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and start all over again. It was an old cliche, even back then. One that most people only told themselves so they could sleep better at night. Though history shows there's been some truth to it. Take a look at any number of the early wasteland factions or governments, and it'll make one thing clear. Man's capacity for rebuilding is still alive and well. Though recently, rebuilding civilization has proven more difficult than just pulling oneself up by the bootstraps and starting over again. If you're going to create something new from the old, you've got to make sure to last. There aren't too many new things being built in the Mojave today, which makes the divide all the more special. Years ago, there was a growing community within the towns of Hopeville and Ashton. This community was given life through trade, with new supplies and goods coming from the few couriers willing to brave the unusual weather. It's no understatement to say that these couriers paved the way for the settlement's continued growth, acting as a sort of lifeline back to a more civilized world. Over time, though, Hopeville and Ashton gained the attention of both the NCR and Legion alike each taking a keen interest in the settlement's rich trade potential and tactical advantages. Folk living there came to call their little community the Divide, a quaint reference to them dividing the East and the West. Now in time, that name would take on new meaning. One day, for unknown reasons, the Divide as they knew it ceased to be. In a series of great flashes, the society that they had built was annihilated once more by atomic fire. For the few people that hadn't died in the initial blast, it must have looked like the Great War had repeated itself, as their way of life came to a fiery end. The landscape that had once played host to open trade and commerce was now a nuclear hellscape, complete with gaping chasms and deep wounds in the earth. The leftover sand and ash after the explosions only worsened the already perilous weather, creating the infamous dust storms you see today. Those who had not died from the blasts or falling debris felt that dust storm's wrath full on, becoming mutants sustained only by the radioactive winds around them and their own hatred. Their skin flayed from the bodies. These marked men formed small packs and started scavenging the ruins of the Divide. In time, the original meaning of the Divide's name was lost, instead only referring to the monstrous wound that it had become. Even then, it wasn't like there was anyone left to carry on its original meaning. There was, however, one survivor. A man named Ulysses narrowly survived the horrors of the Divide, saved only by mere chance. Ulysses became a sort of caretaker for this new wasteland, 
keeping a watchful eye over its many denizens, careful to make sure none of them made their way into the Mojave. Though he presided over this new divide, Ulysses never forgot about the one that came before. Seeing what happened there firsthand, he vowed to take revenge on the man responsible for this, the monster that had taken away his home, the courier that destroyed his divide. Eventually, Ulysses and that courier did end up meeting, though it's hard to say what exactly happened. What we do know is that Ulysses must have finally gotten his ending to things, as after their fateful meeting, he was never seen again. With Ulysses gone, the Divide lost its watchful guardian, as did the beasts that resided there. Uncertainty reigned for a time within the ranks of the Marked Men, with some of the more violent members planning to form raiding parties to invade the Mojave. Fortunately though, a new voice would come to offer a different way of life. A man by the name of Junaid stepped up and became the new de facto leader of the Marked Men, espousing the virtues of peace and forgiveness. Junaid was a pacifist by nature, and saw fit to rally his fellow men around these ideals. He had seen where their petty hatred and infighting had gotten them, and knew the only path to redemption was through changing their very way of life. In time, the other marked men fell under his leadership, gradually letting go of their once burning hatred in exchange for accepting Junaid's more pacifist point of view. He taught them that beauty could be found anywhere even in a place as desolate as the Divide. He offered them hope, at a time when there was so little to go around. From that point on, Junaid and his new following of marked men were known as the Dust Walkers, a pacifist tribe committed to survival without bloodshed, without conquest. Unfortunately for them, their new philosophy would soon be put to the test. Emerging from an unearthed door east of the high road, a band of savages wearing braided hair and painted faces took the divide by storm. These tribals took little time in massacring the dust walkers, killing men, women, and children alike. The tribals set the dust walkers' village ablaze, all to fuel their seemingly unquenchable thirst for destruction. Yet by some stroke of good luck, the dust walkers were able to successfully repel the invading tribals killing their leaders and throwing them from the peak of the high road itself. Though they had survived, the Dust Walkers were far from victorious. The battle left them seriously weakened, with even fewer members to help rebuild what the tribals had destroyed. Yet through it all, Junaid offered hope. Though spiritually crushed by the loss of their loved ones, the Dust Walkers, under Junaid's guidance, once more swore to pacifism and began to rebuild. What had started out as their darkest moment soon became the beginning of their golden age. In the years following the Tunnelmen's attack, the Dust Walkers gradually began to thrive in the wasteland. The villages and homes that the tribals had destroyed were rebuilt. New ways of supplying food and water were discovered. Even the local wildlife ceased to be an issue as the Dust Walkers learned the ways of taming Deathclaws. Thanks to these aspects, life in the Divide only improved. With the help of their new pets, the Dust Walkers were able to effectively rid the Divide of tunnelers altogether, driving them far out of the region. Even the flying dust storms that were once a staple of the Divide's hellish landscape began to subside. Thanks to Junaid's preachings of compassion and forgiveness, the Dust Walkers were able to enjoy a few great years of peace and prosperity. As the Mojave began to fall into disarray, the Divide saw an increase in weary travelers seeking asylum from the horrors back home, all of which Junaid and the Dust Walkers welcomed with open arms. This, in addition to the Dust Walkers' new connections with neighboring tribes, began to make up for those they had lost in the initial massacre. For a while, it seemed as if their worst days were behind them, and that the future was once again bright. Little did they know that the past would soon repeat itself once again. Once more emerging from the pitch black corridors east of the high road, a new band of tribals entered the divide. Though their faces were painted differently, their intentions were no different from those who came before. These tribals stumbled across the Dustwalkers' new village, and once again they brought violence with them. 
For a second time, their village was raised to the ground, their sick and young butchered, and their very way of life nearly snuffed out altogether. Thankfully, this time, the Dust Walkers were able to more effectively fight back their aggressors, once more beating them all the way back to the tunnel's entrance. Though this time, the Dust Walkers were determined to prevent something like this ever happening again. They followed the fleeing tribals into the tunnels, killing every last one. Two times had they suffered from the hatred of these tunnel men, and no longer would they tolerate it. A little while later, the Dust Walkers began to rebuild once more. Though they still believed in the virtues of pacifism and forgiveness, Junaid and the other Dust Walkers agreed that no matter what evil came out of that tunnel, it had to be destroyed. But that's all old history. It's been almost two decades since the last Tunnelman attack, and a lot has changed in the Divide. Today, the Dustwalkers are part of a multi-tribe alliance. These tribes include the Mole Herders, a nomadic tribe that, true to its name, herd mole rats and other wasteland creatures for food. The Sun Children, who come from the forest to the north, untouched by the horrors of the Mojave and Divide. The Deep Wells, a tribe of craftsmen originating from the abandoned gold mines in the Divide. They pride themselves on their mechanical ability and weapon crafting, as well as their access to clean water. And finally, there's the Stone Wolves, the most militaristic of the tribes. They provide a sort of ongoing protection for the other tribes, being the only one among them to possess a genuine knowledge of warfare. Altogether, these five tribes live in harmony with one another, freely trading and living in peace. The Dustwalkers still accept any Mojave refugees that come their way, having truly taken Junaid's teachings to heart, though despite their outward kindness and compassion, the Dustwalkers remain forever cautious, always keeping an eye on that tunnel east of the high road, always waiting for the Tunnelmen to return. Though who exactly were the Tunnelmen? And more importantly, where did they come from? Despite Junaid's teachings and the general belief among the Dustwalkers, they weren't just some random demons hoping to wreak havoc upon the Divide. No, those tribals had to come from somewhere even further than the dark tunnels where they drew their last breaths. Perhaps their goal wasn't to get to the Divide, but instead was to get away from somewhere else, somewhere they were no longer safe. Of course, that raises the most burning question of all. What exactly were they running from? In the wasteland, nowhere is truly sacred. Years ago, when much of the earth was still pristine, prospectors from near and far would devote their short lives to seeking their paradise. Older civilizations would teach their children about these hallowed lands, places far removed from the horrors of the world they had known, an escape from the monotony of their everyday life. But as time went on, and the world's focus shifted more to consumerism, the search for paradise was slowly replaced by the daily grind. It's hard to find the promised land when you're working two jobs just to make rent. As a way to still scratch that age-old itch of running off to some better place, many pre-war thrill-seekers instead opted to venture into the wild, traveling to any number of pre-war nature preserves or state parks. In a way, these places were a kind of paradise. Maybe not a promised land, but still, a place where folk could forget the struggles of everyday life and find some sort of peace. Paradise is where you make it, after all, and no place was closer to that than Zion Canyon. After the bombs dropped, Zion was cast into the same darkness as the rest of the world, smothered by radiation and burned by atomic fire. Though unlike so many other places, Zion began to heal. In time, after decades of slow progress, Zion Canyon began to look a whole lot like it did before the war, once again rich with plants and wildlife, and home to some of the only clean water in this wasteland. In time, even the radiation cleared, leaving Zion almost as pristine as it was before the bombs. This proved to be especially useful to the dominant tribe in Zion, the Saros. The Saros tribe lived off the fat of the land for years, taking advantage of the wild animals, plants, and clean water native to Zion. Though they had little contact with the outside world, that would soon change when two men came to join them. Joshua Graham and Daniel, 
two missionaries from a place called New Canaan found refuge at Zion, both among the few survivors to make it out of their home alive. New Canaan had been effectively destroyed by a group of tribals called the White Legs under the orders of Caesar. The two men, along with a few other survivors, hoped to make a new home out of Zion and to keep the memory of New Canaan alive. Though unluckily for them, their troubles had followed them. The White Legs, determined to destroy all traces of their people, followed Joshua and Daniel into Zion, beginning a campaign of destruction against both them and the Saros tribe. Though Joshua and Daniel heralded from the same home, the two men held very different beliefs. Daniel believed that they and the tribals should shun violence and abandon Zion altogether, while Joshua believed that the only answer was war. Joshua had seen plenty of warfare in his day and knew that he and the rest of the survivors could only run for so long. Instead, he argued that they should militarize the tribals living in Zion and destroy the White Legs once and for all. The two men argued for days on what the right course of action was, but it wasn't until the courier arrived that a decision was finally made. Joshua and his new friend from the Mojave ended up going behind Daniel's back and recruiting the Sorrows for their war against the White Legs. Backed by both the Sorrows and the Dead Horses tribe, Joshua and the courier made short work with the White Legs destroying much of their forces and expelling the rest of them from Zion altogether. The few survivors of the White Legs escaped through Pine Creek Tunnel, traveling into a place the tribals called the Long Dark, an expansive system of near pitch black corridors. Originally built by vault before the war, the Long Dark was meant to act as a sort of escape tunnel in the event that its vault, Vault 74, ever needed to be evacuated. Didn't take long for the White Legs to discover this, and go on to once more wreak havoc. After they had finished butchering the denizens of Alt-74, the White Legs pressed onwards, finally reaching the end of the Long Dark and entering the Divide, only to be killed by the Dustwalkers shortly after. Back in Zion, things had only gotten worse between Daniel and Joshua. Furious about what he and the Courier had done, Daniel condemned Joshua for effectively turning the once passive sorrows into just another band of savages. Joshua took little notice of Daniel's protests and instead doubled down. Over time and under the watchful eye of Joshua, the Sorrows and the Dead Horses became nothing more than just another raider tribe in the wasteland, just like the White Legs before them. Daniel was predictably beside himself. Once more he made his feelings known to Joshua and once more he was shut down. Worse yet, Joshua, fearing that Daniel might convince the Sorrows to return to their passive ways, ordered him to be cast out of Zion and never to return. For a second time, Daniel was forced to turn his back on his home. Though unluckily for Joshua and his band of tribals, a new threat would emerge in Zion, one that simply couldn't be killed or ran out. A pathogenic fungus introduced to the canyon years ago had begun to reproduce rapidly. This pathogen entered the atmosphere, quickly spreading through the canyon as infections grew dramatically. Those infected with the fungus often suffered in great pain for days before ultimately dying of organ failure. Though dying was only half the problem. The corpses of those who had died from the pathogen would soon reanimate, their bodies now covered in a thick moss-like growth and attacking anyone around them on sight. These spore carriers only worsened the spread of the fungus and posed a clear and present danger to anyone still living in the canyon. Only a few years after the fungus spread, the spore carriers, in addition to the unlivable weather conditions, decimated all wildlife in Zion. Meanwhile, during his exile, Daniel had journeyed back to the home of the dead horses, Dead Horse Point, only to find that it had been burnt to the ground. Devastated, Daniel knew that he had to tell Joshua and once more try and save the sorrows from their violent ways. Entering Zion Canyon later that year, Daniel was met by a sorrow hunting party and was brought before Joshua shortly after. Though initially hostile to his arrival, Joshua listened as Daniel told him the fate of Dead Horse Point and the many other horrors that had befallen the Mojave. Daniel was given refuge, and for a time, the two former friends seemed to make peace with one another. Though that wasn't meant to last. Daniel and Joshua still clashed on what was right for the tribals 
but more importantly, the two of them disagreed on how they should dispose of their dead. As more and more tribals died of the fungus, Daniel believed that the only way to ensure they wouldn't come back as spore carriers was to burn their corpses, a notion that Joshua refused to entertain. Having seen firsthand the horrors of fire, Joshua forbade the burning of corpses, despite Daniel's pleas. Though in time, Joshua's ability to lead came into question. Joshua was slowly dying, having been infected by the fungus not too long ago. In his last days alive, Joshua promoted his second-in-command, Follows Jock, to acting war chief of the Dead Horses and Sorrows, just to spite Daniel. Once more, Daniel pleaded for the tribals to burn his body, only to be refused once again. Joshua had burned enough, and it was his time to be buried. Follows Jock, now known as Leads with Jock, took Joshua's body to one of the pre-war ranger stations in Zion, finally laying the burnt man to rest. In the months that followed, Zion only became more perilous. Attacks from the spore carriers, or moss men, as the tribals had called them, only became more common. Daniel, despite the wishes of the tribals, began torching their corpses in the night, convinced it was the only way they could prolong their survival. Defenses were set up to ward off any future mossmen attacks, though it soon became clear that the tribals could no longer stay in Zion. The weather seemed to only worsen, as traces of the cloud from the Mojave began to enter. The toxins mixed with Zion's already polluted atmosphere, creating a sickly green fog that covered the entire canyon and aiding in spreading the fungus even further. On top of that, more and more reports were coming out about a supposed giant moss man stalking the now hazy corridors of Zion. It soon became clear to both Daniel and Leeds with Chuck that they had no choice but to leave. Leeds with Chuck ordered the exodus of Zion shortly after. Daniel and the rest of the tribals made their way to Pine Creek Tunnel, just as the White Lakes did years ago. Though instead of following them, Daniel chose to stay behind. Leeds with Chuck and the rest of the tribals made the venture through the long dark, eventually making it to the other side, entering the divide just as the White Legs did years before. And just like the White Legs, both the Sorrows and the Dead Horses were attacked by the Dustwalkers. Those that had fled from the initial fighting made their way through the long dark once again, only to find that the tunnel had been sealed behind them by Daniel. The Dead Horses and Sorrows died there, trapped in the long dark, indirectly killed by the same man who once desperately tried to save them. On the other side of that door, Daniel had unfinished business. Hearing the rumors of the tall moss man and having seen it with his own eyes, Daniel took it upon himself to kill this monster, once and for all. Armed with an assortment of incendiary weapons and grenades, Daniel made his way up to one of the old ranger stations, ready to finish things once and for all. In the end, Daniel was never seen or heard from again. You could argue that Daniel died like so many others before him, suffering a slow death as the fungus shut down his organs, one by one. Some might even say he was killed by any number of the spore carriers running around Zion. But in the end, we all know what really killed him. Or more accurately, who did? Only one thing could have killed Daniel, and that was the monster that haunts Zion to this day the unkillable abomination responsible for slaughtering anyone unlucky enough to find themselves in that godforsaken canyon. It could only have been the work of the Wendigo. Human history is a long tapestry that stretches from one disaster to the next. Whether it be the Great War, the Master's Super Mutant Army, or the current mess the Mojave's in today, Humanity has come face to face with extinction level events time after time, yet we always somehow manage to come out the other end alive. We're not unlike roaches in that respect. Tough to kill, despite how hard some have tried. In a way, there's some comfort in knowing that even after the worst of cataclysms, we'll still be around. The resilience of man could be attributed to any number of things. Pre-war scientists devised state-of-the-art fallout shelters designed to keep humanity alive well after our expiration date. Some old factions like the Brotherhood of Steel or the Followers of the Apocalypse have made a career out of slowly rebuilding the world, securing a safer future in their own colorful way. Though perhaps the greatest testament to humanity's resilience 
lives in those who, when faced with certain death, denied the Reaper and went on living all the same. You might laugh at some of the stories told by old Brahmin barons or junkies when they talk about a man once set ablaze and thrown into the pits of hell, but look beyond the haze of old age and chem abuse and you'll find there's some truth to it. Nothing better encapsulates the resilience of humankind than the story of the burned man. The story of Joshua Graham. Born in a place called New Canaan, Joshua Graham was a gifted man, adept at interpretation. He spent his earlier years there learning the many tribal dialects of the region, acting as a sort of translator between his people and theirs. This would prove to be advantageous when Joshua left New Canaan years later, journeying towards the Arizona wastelands on missionary work. While there, Joshua made contact with the followers of the Apocalypse, but more specifically, with one man, Edward Sallow, though you may know him better as Caesar. Joshua proved to be instrumental in the early years of the Legion, acting as a translator between Edward and the many tribes they came into contact with. If it weren't for him, it's likely there never would have been a legion. As a result of this loyalty, Caesar promoted Joshua to be his top field commander, or legate, the first the legion had ever known. For a time, Joshua and Caesar were unchallenged in their campaign through Arizona, all until one of Caesar's frumentari brought word of a pre-war structure to the west, the Hoover Dam. Protected by the mightiest tribe the legion had fought yet, Caesar was obsessed. In time, they launched a full-on assault of the dam, with Joshua Graham himself leading the charge, though we all know how that story goes. Thanks to the quick thinking of the NCR Rangers there, Joshua and the rest of the Legion forces suffered a humiliating defeat, returning to Caesar in shame. Caesar did not take this failure lightly. Though he and Joshua had become close in their years of conquest, he knew that an example had to be made. An example of what happens when you fail the mighty Kaisar. As punishment for his failure, Joshua Graham's body was covered in pitch, set aflame, then thrown into the deepest canyon of Arizona. Rumor has it, he didn't even scream on the way down. With his body broken and charred, Joshua's fate seemed clear. A lesser man would have died from the engulfing flames around him, let alone the fall to the bottom. But Joshua Graham was no lesser man. No, Joshua possessed a kind of will that few others in the wasteland ever have. A burning will to live. To outlast the horrors of the world even if his body nearly failed him. A resilience to carry on, no matter what. It should come as no surprise when Days later, Joshua woke up and walked all the way back to New Canaan. It took him three agonizing months to return to his home, where he was welcomed with open arms. In time, Joshua would begin to let go of the vanity and ego he had developed by Caesar's side, rekindling his faith and strengthening his resolve. Though fate seemed determined to test that resolve time and time again, when New Canaan was destroyed, Joshua, his friend Daniel, and a few other survivors left for Zion, intent on starting anew among the untouched wilderness there. Though Joshua mourned the death of his home, his anger would not get the better of him until the ones responsible, the White Legs, followed these survivors into Zion. Though his friend Daniel abhorred violence, it seemed to come to Joshua naturally as he desperately sought to destroy the White Legs as recompense for their deeds. In time, thanks to the help of the courier, Joshua Graham's lust for warfare returned, as he and his army of tribals laid waste to the White Leg forces in Zion. This was the beginning of the end for Joshua. In the years that followed, Joshua began to warp the minds of the tribals under his control, using them as his own personal militia. They began raiding nearby settlements and tribes on Joshua's command, rarely out of necessity. His days of practicing mercy and of letting go of his warmongering ways were gone, as was the man that Joshua used to be. Though soon enough, that would no longer matter. As more and more denizens of Zion were killed by either the Mossmen or the Airborne Spores, Joshua was among the many 
that had become infected. By the time Daniel returned to the canyon, Joshua's fate was sealed. The man whose life was nearly taken at Hoover Dam and nearly snuffed out by Caesar's punishment finally felt death upon him. When he eventually did die, his cult of tribals mourned him for days. Daniel, once a friend to Joshua, pleaded with them to burn his body to prevent him from coming back as one of the spore carriers that was destroying Zion. Though the tribals did not budge. Leads with Chalk, now the acting war chief, took it upon himself to bury Joshua, taking him to a place they called the Airy, and finally laying his body to rest. If they had listened to Daniel, perhaps they could have avoided the nightmare that was about to be unleashed. Maybe there was something in Joshua that made his mutation different. Perhaps his will to live transcended even death, being wrongly translated into the abomination he became. Maybe it was his genetics, his DNA being recoded and remixed after nearly dying at Caesar's hand. Whatever the case, the thing that emerged from his grave was no longer human. No longer him. Mere hours after Joshua died, the Wendigo was born. Standing anywhere from 12 to 15 feet tall, the Wendigo is a giant spore carrier given unholy life by the same pathogen responsible for destroying Zion. Stories about the Wendigo range wildly on account of their authors either being dead or dying. What we do know is that it's unnaturally fast, able to close the distance between you and it in less than a heartbeat. Its speed is only rivaled by its strength, with its long, mossy appendages putting even death claws to shame, ripping apart just about anything or anyone. And the worst part? By all accounts, it seems to be just about unkillable. I've heard stories of full NCR battalions trying to take it down, only to be slaughtered like cattle, their bodies so badly mangled you couldn't tell one corpse from another. Though it does have one weakness. There's no sure way to kill it, but if you at least want to increase your chances of survival, you'll need to remind it of who it was before. How, you might ask? Well, his persistence isn't the only thing that outlasted Joshua's mind and body. His fear of fire did as well. You won't kill it, nothing will. But if you set the monster ablaze, it'll turn tail and run like a bat out of hell. Though that doesn't mean it's done. No matter how many times you torch the Wendigo, it will always come back, intent on ripping you limb from limb. With all that in mind, it makes sense why Daniel and the rest of the tribals chose to flee Zion. To the tribals there, the Wendigo was a sign that they were no longer welcome, a divine force of nature sent to punish them for their misdeeds. Only Daniel saw past the superstition. For months, with every story he heard to the first-hand experiences he had, Daniel began to piece together the Wendigo's true nature. During their exodus, after the tribals made their way into the long dark, Daniel stayed behind. He knew what the Wendigo was, and more importantly, he knew he had to kill it, to finally put his old friend to rest. Locking the doors of the long dark behind him, Daniel made his way to the airy, intent on setting Joshua free once more, through searing flame. Though like so often before, Daniel's wishes were ignored. In the years that followed, more and more unlucky visitors would enter Zion, either seeking the paradise of years past or on diplomatic missions. A group of NCR troopers were deployed to Zion a few years back, part of the Reformed Republic's attempts to clear the cloud in NCR-affected areas. Though, predictably, things haven't exactly gone to plan. Today, Zion remains a hellhole, still covered in a hazy green fog and populated by hordes of spore carriers. If by some unfortunate circumstance you find yourself there, you do well to listen to what I'm about to say. Stick to the waterways, travel only when the sun begins to rise, and always carry some kind of incendiary weapon. Don't journey into Zion thinking that if you're careful enough, you'll be able to avoid the Wendigo. It haunts that canyon like something out of a pre-war ghost story, and it will always find you. 
no matter what. But you're probably bored by now of all this talk of death, suffering, and toxic clouds. It's no mistake to say that things have changed quite a bit since the courier first walked the wastes. Both Zion and the Mojave are husks of their former selves. Not many people are rushing to Vegas or Zion National Park anymore. If anything, it's the complete opposite. A whole lot of folk would give just about anything to escape life in the Mojave and return somewhere that they're truly safe. Though escaping the Mojave isn't the hard part. It's letting go. It's ironic to think that only years ago, this slice of the wasteland offered all kinds of glimmering lights and decadence, drawing folk like a moth to a flame. Nowadays, those lights are exactly that, a Mojave lit up by the glow of countless burning cities. The luckiest thing that can happen to you in Vegas these days is getting the hell out of it, though that might prove harder than you think. Thanks to both NCR meddling and the Tunneler invasion, traversing the Mojave is its own personal hell. You can't just walk out of it like the couriers of years past, although that hasn't stopped some unlucky souls from trying. If you're looking for a quick and easy way out, a bullet to the head is mostly effective, though for anyone hoping to leave with their life, your options are limited. The Divide's your best bet, if you can manage to get there in one piece. That old missile silo west of the canyon wreckage recently collapsed in on itself, making the most direct route there impassable. If you can avoid falling to your death, the folk there will probably welcome you with open arms, so long as you don't take the back way in. Still, the Divide isn't exactly an oasis. For those who wish to find real safety and are willing to think outside the box, there are a few options at escaping the Mojave that might just work. There's a spot southwest of the Mojave known as Camp Adidam, one of the many NCR refugee camps set up under the new follower leadership may seem strange to seek refuge from the same people responsible for killing the Mojave, but the group there is a far cry from Royston Bernard's splinter cell back in Vegas. They've got food, supplies, and shelter for any asylum seekers willing to make the trek. The only problem is getting there. There used to be all sorts of stories about pre-war action heroes climbing aboard fancy jet planes and just flying away from their problems. Seems like a laughable idea these days, but as I said, if you really want out, you only need to think outside the box. You can find a few rusted out planes littering the Mojave, if you know where to look, and while none of them are in any way skyworthy, with the right know-how and materials, you might just be able to get one up and running. From there, it's as simple as flying off to somewhere safer, and assuming you don't crash. For those without the technical know-how to get a pre-war junker up and running, flying to freedom isn't completely out of the question. If you've spent any time near the Outer Vegas Gates, then chances are you've seen that near-pristine vertebrate parked on the roof of Camp McCarran, one of the many relics the NCR left behind when they evacuated years ago. No doubt all sorts of survivors have dreamt of commandeering it and flying off, but there's a reason no one has. Camp McCarran is locked down tighter than most pre-war vaults, making entry from any of the gates virtually impossible. The only way left is through its monorail line, located on the Strip. You can probably guess why none of those pipe dreams have ever come true, but if you're truly dead set on riding that bird off to safety, getting there isn't completely impossible. You'll just need to be prepared to break into the Strip, survive its many new denizens, and avoid the toxic cloud on your way to the NCR embassy there. But even then, that's only half the battle. Rumor has it that the camp is crawling with feral ghouls, making any escape attempt all the more unlikely. But assuming you're able to weather all these nearly impassable obstacles, and you find yourself face to face with that ever-coveted vertebrate, you do well to try and pilot it yourself. It's been landlocked for quite a few years now. There's a good chance the autopilot is shot. So make sure you're the one behind the wheel, or you may end up somewhere even worse than the Mojave. If flying's not an option for you, there are a few other routes to safety you can take on foot. I've heard stories told about a place the courier visited years ago. The Big Empty, a mad scientist's dream come true. If you could think of it, they probably made it, and it could probably kill you too. In recent years, the place has become nothing more than an oversized swimming pool, flooded by malfunctioning weather systems and some out-of-control robots going haywire. To make matters worse, the parts not submerged have become an impromptu battleground for the Brotherhood of Steel and a group of crazed tech scavengers. 
Needless to say, time hasn't made the place any safer. But the big empty itself isn't the main focus. The important part is what's in it. The eggheads there had years to develop all sorts of scientific marvels, and I'm willing to bet that somewhere in that murky war zone, there's some sci-fi gadget you could use to escape. But that's one hell of a risk to take on a hunch. No way of escaping the Mojave is without danger, so you do well to pick the option that has the most plausible chance of reaching safety. If that's the case, this last option isn't for you. No doubt you've heard the tales of Zion Canyon, the stories of a 12-foot-tall monster roaming the lands and killing anyone and everyone it can catch. The horror stories of a polluted atmosphere, suffocated by an impenetrable green fog. In short, the last place you'd think to look for safety. But ironically enough, if you're willing to put everything on the line, there's no more assured way of reaching salvation than through Zion. Years ago, during their war with the White Legs, a man named Daniel suggested that he and the Sorrows tribe abandon Zion for a place up north called Grand Staircase. While he and the Sorrows never succeeded in their escape, that doesn't mean you couldn't pick up where they left off. There's an NCR stronghold set up in the old Sorrows camp in the northwest. Chances are they've got just about everything you'll need to escape, though I wouldn't count on them giving them up so easily. Zion's a dangerous place, but if you're able to survive the near-endless horrors thrown at you, the Grand Staircase might just be your best bet for safety. Just make sure you pack plenty of incendiary rounds. But knowing all this, you're probably wondering why I haven't left the Mojave. And more importantly, how I know everything I've told you. Let's just say, letting go isn't easy for some folk. The Mojave used to be home to all sorts of stories and intrigue, Tales of great woe and of decisive victories. Stories worth telling. In the years that followed, as those stories began to fade from memory, new ones began to take their place. The old Mojave died, but its legend lives on. I stay here because the terrors that took their place are worth documenting. Worth spreading word of. Because nothing in the wasteland stays the same forever. An old friend once taught me that, sometimes, preserving history is worth putting your life at risk. The most inspiring figures aren't just war heroes or folk legends. Sometimes they're nothing more than humble historians. Folk content to watch the world move on around them, all in the hopes of sharing the stories they found along the way. And moreover, the role of a historian is not just to document history, but to respect it and to let it progress naturally. So why haven't I tried to lead the Mojave? Why not take that vertebrate and skip town or rough it through Zion? Because that's not my story to tell. It may seem foolish to stay behind and document what the Mojave's become, to be a historian in a world that demands hardened survivors. But still, here I am. Telling you these tales of fallen empires and of once shining cities. Maybe I do it to pay homage to what came before, to keep alive the soul of a land long dead. Or maybe it's to keep alive the adventurous curiosity of the storytellers that once inspired me. Maybe. But I'm content with not knowing. My journey's never been for riches or to find some promised land. It's been for knowledge. To explore the endless mysteries this vast wasteland has to offer and to share their stories with others. That's all we really have in the end. Stories allow us to travel to places we've never actually been, live lives some of us can only dream of. Stories can inspire armies marching into battle and give hope to communities rebuilding from past mistakes. From tyrannical despots to humble mortars, all stories deserve to be told, to be documented, and shared with others. Even yours, whatever it may be and wherever it may go. Because in the end, no matter how many times history repeats itself, no matter how inhospitable this world may seem, there will always be stories to tell, even if they're for another day. <laughs>